This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Yeah. And today's guest, we've got Gordon Singh. How are you? I'm all right, James. So nice to finally meet you, my mate. How are you yeah, keeping? Yeah, really good, mate. Really, in fact, really, I life is going, can't complain, brother. Same here, my brother. Same yeah. here. That's good. Then. It's a nice sunny day in London, so hopefully you'll have a yeah. good podcast today, mate. Thanks for coming down. Very Thanks, interesting bro. story. A man behind the EDL yeah. with Tommy Robinson, who's a yeah. good friend with you. Yeah. You've been out of prison. I know a lot of people, listen, there's a lot of mixed reviews with EDL, which we'll touch on. Yeah. But... You look at the strength of what Tommy's doing now, no matter yeah. what you say about the man, the guy is a force. Yeah. Um, he's getting a hundred, over 100,000 people on the streets. and 100%. Mm. It's unbelievable yeah. what one man can do. And of course, he'll become a threat, especially if people don't agree with him. Yeah. Obviously, he's been cancelled. He's been put in prison. Yeah. It's mad, but you're very well connected with him. And yeah. like I say, the EDL, was it founded in what, 2009? Uh, English fans think, well, I think United People Loot, which was a United People Loot and the UPL, mm-hmm. which was what Tommy and Kevin Carroll, etc., they started first. I think that started around about the 2008 part. Mm-hmm. But when that started gaining a lot of momentum, they created it into the English Defence League, which started like 2008 and back end of 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. It was around about mid 2009, end of 2009, when I actually got involved. Actually, yeah, mid 2009. So, quite not too far from the birth of it. There were only a few demonstrations in. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a demonstration in Nottingham first it was the first time I've ever gone on social media or anything like that so I started setting up a Facebook account trying to look it uh, look more into mm-hmm. it etc yeah. I got hold of a few like-minded individuals on there you know and whatever the press and everybody told you about the English fencing being far right and racism I saw it for myself that never even existed at all and that's what that's why I really got interested in it and then so yeah there was a couple of people that brought me forward to Tommy then the next thing you know within a few months well maybe within 12 months was kind of like running the organization together I was organizing demonstrations doing a bit of media work tommy was doing the merchandising a lot of media and all the like interviews and stuff out there and kind of yeah so it kind of flew from mm-hmm. there my friend yeah before we get into everything though i always like to go back to the start with my guests yeah get my, my, more of a bit of an understanding about yourself yeah. where you grew up how it all began yeah so uh yeah gourmet sing i grew up in sunny nottingham in the east midlands uh home of the famous city ground nottingham forest i'm not the biggest fo- football fan but i did have to plug them otherwise all my mates will be saying <laughs> what the hell you on james Ingram yeah. podcast you didn't even mention forest you know what i mean so yeah big up the boys at the city ground uh, yeah, so I grew up in, you know, Sikh Punjabi family. My my father was born here. My mother was born in India. Um, she came over. My father got married to us uh, not too soon after my grandfather passed in the mid-70s. Uh, grew up in kind of a nice affluent area, Beeston of Nottingham. Uh, back in the heyday when my granddad was alive, you know, before me and before my f- father got married or anything, he actually did quite well in property. But unfortunately, what happens when people pass and then all of that seems to crumble, he left a little bit behind for my grandmother to take care of and that kind of, you know, put the food on the table, etc. Along uh, with as, as, as long with my mum, like working in factories all her life. And 
and stuff. So we grew up in a nice area, but we were piss poor. You know what I mean? The mm -hmm. house was a state. Um, times used to be very hard, especially growing up in that area when you're growing up with a lot of affluent children around and then you're still trying to keep up with the Joneses yourself at such a young age and you can't, you know what I mean? So yeah, that was a bit problematic, but you know what? My family were absolutely incredible. My dad weren't the hardest as workers, let's just say. He liked a little tipple, you know what I mean? Like we all do. Well, I try to keep away from it myself now. Yeah. Maybe the odd one here and there, but not too much. But yeah, so yeah, I grew up in Nottingham. That was basically it, really. I went to school, did all right. Could have done a bit better, did my GCSEs, went on to college. I got thrown out of a lot of colleges, you know what I mean? I was selling things I shouldn't have been selling, doing things I shouldn't have been doing, messing around with people I shouldn't be messing around with. And then I ended up having to sit my um, A-level exams down in the nunnery in Cambridge because no college in Nottingham would accept me. But then once I actually completed the A-levels, I was a year behind because of it all. Once I actually managed to complete that, um, I didn't really want to go on to university. My family needed money. They, were, they didn't have a pot to piss in. My young, my young brother was not too far born. He was only a few years old. I wanted to do something to him, help him out, try and like do the things for him that my grandfather did for my father, you know what I mean? Which I, which I missed out on, you know, private school, a little bit of a better life. So I started going to graft a little bit, I started doing a bit of work, I started doing some other little bits and bobs, extracurricular activities on the streets, which if it's all right with you, I'd rather not go into, you know yeah. what I mean? Do you want to back <laughs> you too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I used to work, but then, you know, and these things led to like my first business. And then back in the day, I think it was like 2002, I saved up over a couple of years and um, I started a rave business in Nottingham where I used to organize a UK garage events in nightclubs and various halls and stuff like that. It was all right, it had an ups and downs. Then I started linking with some other people out of town and that got me a little bit more popular, made me a lot more money when I started actually involving myself with other people that were a lot more experienced out there. Being a 20 year old, I actually thought that I, I knew it all, you know what I mean? But I didn't and I learned the hard way. So yeah, that came and then I started going into a bit of property with fam with a family member of mine, like development. Um, it was just basically just like buying houses, refurbishing them, selling them on and stuff like Flatting that. Them. Yeah, and then no like planning permission or nothing like that. You know what I mean? It was just quick in ins and outs. In them days, it was easily done as well. The mortgages were easily obtainable and all that stuff. So. Started doing a bit of that, but you know, me being a little bit mischievous and always wanted a little bit more out of life, my finger was always still in a couple of the pies, you know what I mean? And then and then after that, I had a pub for a little bit, but my finger was always in a few pies. And then obviously years passed and then... What was the pub? I did three horseshoes down in Beeston on Middle Street. Yeah, it's not down now, flats now. Um, I had it for a year. It was great at first. When I first bought it, it was absolutely excellent. But then you know what happened? The smoking ban came in. And you know when the smoking ban came in? That, that, then that recession in 2008 come in. And that just fucking wiped it out. Everybody started. It's the first time Tesco started doing like free crates for 18 quid and stuff like that. So everyone started buying booze and just sitting at home and drinking. And no one was coming to the pub. I went from making a thousand pounds a day to taking like 30, 40 quid. And I was like, bloody hell. And that really put me right back you know what I mean financially and then it put a lot of burden on my family because I wasn't responsible for a lot of their bills and helping my brother through private school and stuff so doing what I always do I kind of go went back to my old ways a little bit and you know start becoming a little bit of a scallywag again just to get some money together so I could pay the debts that are due from the pub and keep my family's head above water which I did manage to do what was the rave scene like UK garage rave scene it was you know at first when I started it was it wasn't too bad because it was it was it was more UK garage so it was more like EZ master steps that sort of side of it we used to book you know the dream team with Spoonie and all the rest of it the nicer MCs but what basically happened when when I got involved in it it started converting from UK garage into UK grime now that got a lot darker and I kind of favored that music anyway so I started booking these artists from the grime scene left right and center a lot of famous artists that you see on TV and stuff nowadays I started booking them and then it dragged an influence of the street a part of the, the rave culture it dragged a, a part of the street into the nightclubs which I th which I wasn't prepared for and then you've got stabbings you've got shootings there'll be a stabbing at a put there'll be a stabbing at a rave and then I can't do the next two raves that I bought there'll be a shooting at one nightclub in one area of East Midlands then my rave gets knocked on the head and I was only young and a little bit gullible to it and all of a sudden I've lost my security money I've lost my nightclub money I've lost money that I've given to artists to turn up because they've had to ban me because of the artists that I'm, that I'm having performance stuff so it did actually turn into were being a little bit of a nightmare i had a little bit of money put aside and that's when my uncle turned around to me and says well how about we just whack it into a bit of a property and keep you clear of this so you can keep yourself and your family's head above the water so mm -hmm. i managed to do that and then just crack on from there then it was only a few years later when i bought the pub was your family business orientated no my grandfather was my grandfather was a very successful businessman in property <clears throat> do you get that from him 
they say that people have been mentioning it recently because obviously my my new business uh, I've been doing I'll tell you all about it in a bit when we get to it but um, uh, I mean I buy I buy houses in the northeast county Durham Teesside area and I rent them out I learned that from a man while I was in jail um, who kind of put me on the street but uh, it, I'll, I'll tell you about that when we get to it but since I've been doing since I've been building my empire up in the northeast for the last six seven years especially when I come out when I came out of prison a lot of people have been making a, um, similarities between me and my grandfather I don't think I'm nowhere as successful as what he was at my age I don't think I'm as hard working as him but to have that kind of you know affirmation it does make me feel quite confident in myself that maybe in some some ways I am actually going in the right direction on the wrong one mm -hmm. so yeah so but my mother worked my mother still works in a factory and uh, my grandmother had a few houses that my granddad left behind and she just maintained them to just keep a few bills pay a few bills and my dad he spent more and more of his time in the pub you know what I mean mm -hmm. so yeah he never worked or anything like that so yeah my brother my brother works hard my brother's got um, a, a master's degree uh, from Manchester University and uh, he's got a sales job in private in private healthcare, so he does mm -hmm. well. Not really business orientated, but he's a worker bee. You know what I mean? So the Sikhs yeah. love to drink. Mate, My mate, friend, you know I get Sikhs mate. in Glasgow. Listen to the mate. best guys ever. Mate. The stuff they do for the homeless, the work that they do, yeah. but the whiskey that they drink. I went to a couple you, of weddings. You know, you know, back what? in the day, uh, and uh, I was fucked uh, up. Only recently, in the last few months, I've decided to move myself into shift my life in completely in, into a whole completely new area. Mm. I've been. I've known, I've grown up in a town, I've grown up around men, I've grown up, grown up around people and found family members where you go and earn your money and you go to the pub every day and you have a drink yeah. and on the weekend you get absolutely fucking spangled. And then when I drink, it's the other things I end up purchasing that are problematic for me. I've tried to keep away from it. I've had a few little slip ups recently. I don't mind a couple of pines, but you know, after that, I'm kind of done with it now. And the reason behind that being is, you know, I'm married now, you know what I mean? Me and my wife are uh, trying for children. I've seen what alcohol has done to like my father, you know, to my grandfather in a way as well. It was kind of like alcohol that killed him. He had a bit of a family upset and he hit the bottle big time and that's what kind of wiped him out. And so it kind of runs in our family a little bit and I don't want to get caught up in that trap, especially for the first, especially since for the first time in my life, I actually truly believe I've got something that's really big that I'm building on that's really true. It's truly worth fighting for and keeping hold of and trying to mm -hmm. increase from a family legacy for the future, yeah. you know what I mean? So I'm trying to keep away from all that now. And, and so I'm trying. I've had a few mishaps. That's all but, you, you know, can do. It happens. You know See, you mean? had a few mishaps. Is that because of the football was on? No, I don't watch football. Oh, do when you everyone not? went to watch football, I was watching the tennis Wimbledon final. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mm. like I say with the Sikhs, I love their beliefs. I love what they stand for. Yeah. The helping people, even like you say, you've just yeah. brought gifts in and, and sweets. They yeah, used yeah. to always do that when they came to my but mom's it, house yeah, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. There was always gifts. There yeah, was always... It, it, it's always, it's, I mean, I've always, it, it's always, it, that's just embedded in me. I was never, need, nobody ever had to told me this is the way you've got to act. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? My mum and grandma always just put that in me from day one. If I go to somebody's house for the first time, I always take something with me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Something to, something for them to eat or some sort yeah. of gift to some time. I was actually going to bring you a bottle of whiskey, but then I remember that you're <laughs> on the sober, you're on the sober <laughs> truck as well. I yeah. thought maybe that ain't a good and idea. There's no bring yeah. a half a half ounce of fucking coke. <laughs> Me. Yeah, yeah, if you right. brought that, bro, I would have tell that shit up if I was on the whiskey. Yeah, yeah. I've not so, drank whiskey in fucking nah, eight, nine years. You, usually I do take a bottle of whiskey or something. Yeah. I don't even drink whiskey, you yeah. know what I mean? I, all I drink now, I like to have a couple of pints of Guinness mm -hmm. and that's it. Have a meal, then I go and get my head down. Because yeah. you know, when after I've started going through them couple of pints of Guinness and I start hitting that top shelf, then them elbows are getting cold so, and then yeah. it all just fucking goes tits I think off and then for, the same and, with that. I know and then for three four days I'm absolutely wiped out yeah. I've got, with my career right now with the business that I've built up in the Teesside County Durham with renting the houses I've got a lot of freedom because I've got agents that take care of everything I am actually just about to invest in something new um, I've, the, the investments literally just come through the other week and so the money should be landing any day so hopefully that's going to keep me a lot more busier so I'm not going to think about oh I sit at home I've been to the yeah. gym I've been to the spa I've done the shopping I pay the bills what do I do now I go to the fucking pub you know what I mean so hopefully that's going to get me a little yeah. bit going again and because that's on the way that's another reason why I wanted to knock it all on the edge you know what I mean I thought I've got something real now it's, it's time to concentrate man. on it yeah. it is difficult because I've had to stop associating with certain people there's still a few people that I still roll with and I do try to have like look look look, look mate let's have one two pies let's have a steak and go home and then that 90% of the time that's what's been happening mm -hmm. but there's that 10% where it doesn't happen the next minute bam two days in and fucking then you're regretting it for about a week while you're in bed poorly yeah. it's ridiculous but I'm yeah. trying I'm trying I'll get there I'll get that's there. all you can do and try yeah. and like I see even with my story as well it's the, it's the, yeah, it's the same as 90% of fucking 
work in the male population. It's in happening UK. everywhere. The booze and the gear, you, it comes you, hand in hand. You know, before I went to prison in 2013, there weren't hardly anybody doing any gear. When I come out in 2017, I was like, what the fuck? Everybody, people that you wouldn't suspect. You know what I mean? It was yeah. absolutely everywhere. And I couldn't believe how widely available it was all over the place as well. I mean, I, I mean, sometimes I like go to a rave and I may pop a little fella or something like that. You know what I mean? Or get a little bag of Andy or something. But that's very rare I go to raves nowadays anyway, once in a bloody blue moon. But but with that one, it's absolutely everywhere. It's just shocking. It is. And, yeah. and that's hard thing to get away from. When you go to the pub and just having a quick pint, you bump into those two, three lads. And then next minute, you know, some kind of fucking pulling it out. And then it's like, bloody yeah. hell, I'm trying to keep away from that. So, <laughs> and so Three I, days and, later. And, and, so, and so literally, I've, I've, I've stopped associating with certain people. I've stopped drinking in certain areas. The hotel where I got married, you know, it's just a hotel bar. It's just really, really nice people. It's an upmarket hotel in Nottingham. I go and have a pint or two there by myself in the evening. Once I've had a, like, a mile-long swim, I'll have a couple of pints with an uncle or something, then just go mm -hmm. straight home and get to bed. It's you, the best way. Are you scared that it could potentially be like your dad and your granddad 100%, yeah i am very scared yeah because what keeps happening is i keep falling back into the trap where i'm knocking around with a certain person or i'm not blaming it on them it's i'm trust me i'm the instigator of all matters when it comes to anybody in any circle in my life 100 it will be me that says come on let's fuck it let's go for it but when you put me in front of the wrong person then i keep doing it and i don't want to keep repeating that fucking pattern and so I'm trying to stop it now. You know what I mean? I'm I'm doing well, but there's been flare ups. But I think I need to just have a bit more of a bigger break from even having a pint or two, or even being in Nottingham for a longer while before it actually manufactures into something a lot more solid. And it's not even going to be in the back of my mind. Yeah. But you know, I've not bothered talking to anyone or anything like that about it. I'm a I come from that generation. You've got something to sort out, you sort out your fucking self. So, yeah. so yeah, so I'm cracking on with it. But we'll Takes time, mate, like I yeah. say, that's all you can do. So after the pub, what happened? What did you do then? Yeah, so after the pub, then basically, you know, I got a little bit green-fingered and got into a little bit of trouble with the police and stuff. And then, well, I was doing that for a little bit. Um, there were still a couple of properties in Nottingham that I still owned that I put some money into. And then basically from there, you had, like, the English Defence League. And so the pub ended in 2008. That's when the English Defence League started. Uh, we started the English Defence League, hooked up with Tommy and Kev, started organising demonstrations all around the country, started doing media work and stuff like that in any way I could help. Um, so, yeah, we were all over the place. We were absolutely banging. It was completely a whole different life to me. It's for a matter that I believe very strongly in. You know what I mean? Me being a Sikh man, um, our gurus uh, fought against... Um, it, Islam and militant Muslims for absolute centuries. They've tried to wipe us out over over and over again. It was our people that brought down the Mughal Muslim Empire. So I already had instilled in me, and I knew the information from what my elders had told me before about the effect that Islam has had on Sikhism and our people in general post uh, the gurus. So yeah, so I got straight involved in it and started cracking on with it. Once EDL did start a dying of death in 2011, Tommy, despite, Tommy decided to disband it. We were knocking it on the head. I left like a couple months before and then Tommy and Kev like, kind of knocked it on the head 2011. Um, there was a few factions of the very far right that we kicked out of the English Defence League that decided to that that weren't that had nothing to do with the English Defence League and they decided to come back and take that banner over so they can push their narrative. So you just had a few idiots, a few racists on the streets and stuff running around saying they're EDL, but they had nothing to do with it. And then when that kind of happened in 2011, I did a little bit of work in Spain with a friend of mine, and um, yeah, that kind of worked out quite well for us, but. What basically happened on the back end of that is like it all. It's a long story, and that's not enough time on your podcast. I don't think you want me going in yeah, too deep what, into that. What, what, but what happened into that was the whole prison sentence, which was 2013. So, mm -hmm. like in 2013, I received a sentence of um, what was it, uh, seven and a half years for attempted armed robbery, extortion, demanded money with menace as assault. Some, 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 some charges stuck, stuck. The others didn't, and then um, basically from that. I had a few issues with the way the proceedings of the court case was actually going on, going at the time. So I didn't actually turn up to my sentence. That's quite um, out there. That's quite popular. I didn't actually turn up to my sentence. Um, um, I, I, I tried to get through to my lawyer. I tried to have a chat with them. There was ev there was evidence popping up um, post. Uh, they have like a certain date that CPS can put all the evidence in. There was evidence popping up after that date, and there was evidence popping up that I was just like, "That's impossible. It couldn't have been me at all." It's not, you can't tell me that my fingerprints on sticky side of duct tape, where I know for a fact there was no duct tape at that scene, a hundred percent. And that, uh, and you know, and and and, it's, and I'm, I'm the only one that's mentioned, and I'm not even supposed to be. I'm, well, I know what went down there, and I wasn't there. The people, the victims that were in that situation, even said it wasn't Gurmit Singh. But so, how the fuck was my sticky? 
how, how was my fingerprint supposed to be on the sticky side of a duct tape? Whoever picks up duct tape starts handing over the stick, starts handling the sticky side of it. I don't even understand how that happens. And then all these other bits of Bob started coming up, so I decided not to turn up to the trial. And then, yeah, then I went on the run for a little bit, got on my toes for a little bit. That was probably the worst experience of my whole goddamn life. That's a horrible feeling, that is. I couldn't fucking see. <laughs> I was down here just across the water in a hotel over there. Uh -huh. uh, when we drove down here today, uh, you know, uh, uh, in central London, I was like, bloody hell, that's a hotel I used to stay at. I haven't been there for a while, you know what I mean? Playing back memories? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, I was there for about fucking two weeks. It cost me a fortune. Yeah. cost me a bomb. And the thing is, people in there, the manager is a nice, well-to-do hotel. They actually knew about me being on the run because my face was all over the newspapers. It was absolutely everywhere what was um, the meaning what's the what was the meaning behind the start of the edl because obviously people say it's a fucking far right racist movement yeah. of hating islamic is yeah. uh, like islamophobes and yeah. that, everything like yeah what is that a true meaning behind starting the edl the english defense league stands for english uh, the edl stands for english defense league you know back in the day there was rumors that it was actually going to be called equality diversity liberty it started when a group of militant Muslims kept terrorizing and causing havoc on the streets of Luton, um, these, these organiza the organizations that were uh, recruiting these militants were people like Islam for UK. There's a few others, and off the top of my head, James, I can't remember, it was so long ago. And they were causing absolute mayhem on the streets of Luton. Um, they were threatening to do uh, demonstrations at homecoming parades. Well, they did do demonstrations at homecoming parades. There's that... Um, I can't remember the area where they have the parade of the fallen soldiers come home. They were planning on doing demonstrations there. And that's when the Luton people stood up. And it was to stand up because I think Tommy, what, what, what Tommy touched on and what a lot of people in Luton had, had found, because Luton being quite a high Muslim population community, um, Islam and militant Muslims have been having a negative effect on our communities. The politicians may not tell you that because they're in their, you know, their, their glass towers and stuff, and uh, they don't want to, you know, cause any upset. And they don't want to upset anybody in case they don't get their votes, etc. But it has been having a massive, uh, a negative impact on a lot of communities, and I've learned that myself in Nottingham. So the whole point of the English Defence was to gather a movement to put some sort of pressure on the government to listen to people's concerns regarding Islam and militant Muslims in their community. When we started highlighting this and to creating demonstrations all around the country a lot more people started uh, getting involved and getting mobbed up to join us because and then obviously we noticed that our sympathy uh, what, we, what, what we're actually worried about and concerned about a lot of people are sharing them concerns as well and that's why everyone started jumping on board and then and then not too far into the English fence we had the outcry of the grooming scandal where um, police officers, counsellors and government officials have been keeping uh, rape and grooming documentations in clothes for, since the early 90s, where they've got evidence to send people to prison and stuff, and they weren't doing anything about it. Why? Well, pardon? Why not? Well, the reason, well, it was actually proven in the J report that the reason that we're, they weren't going to do anything about it was for the sake of community cohesion. So they wouldn't arrest the um, six sadistic Pakistani grooming men that were committing these crimes against young girls for the basis that they didn't want any upset or any outcry. That's basically why. And, so, and, and that's come out in the J report, and that's been proven over and over again. There was a recent report that came out, and the police in Rotherham have actually, the, the head um, officer, whatever his name is, he's actually um, publicly apologised for the failings during the Rotherham grooming scandal. And so, you know, and, and, and this is just another part of the issues that we had with Islam and militant Muslims in this country. It's, um, if, if, if any, every, any other man was commit such a sadistic crime, they'd be arrested and thrown in jail. But it's a two-tier policing system uh, like what tommy's just recently done on his documentary lawfare that he's put out it's one rule for them and one for for another and that's another thing that we're witnessing so it was everybody to get behind so the english fancy was to get behind a movement that could put some pressure on the government to make them start actually implementing the law and protecting their own people from the threat of militant islam how bad is the grooming gangs bad Huge. It's national. It's gone everywhere. Have, have, have you read any? Have, I mean, you must have had yeah, like I've heard people on stuff, and it's a. Uh... Okay, so the majority of the grooming, well my, well, my opinion is the majority. I mean, uh, Muslims are a four, four, well, back in the day when we were dealing with uh, English Defence League, the Muslim population was around about 3%. I think it sits at around about 4.2% right now. But on average, 97% of the grooming gang cases in this country have been from Pakistani Muslim men. Now, my opinion to that is the fact that Islam actually um, accepts this sort of behavior against women. There's scriptures, I mean, I, I haven't got the Quran in front of me or the Hadith in front of me to completely re read them straight off to you. I don't know them off by heart. But within their scripture, there are parts where it tells men that they are allowed to sleep with children, that they are allowed to use them as sexual slaves. And I think when you've got 
this barbaric ideology um, being pumped for the last 1600 years and it hasn't been changed one by a bit and for, we've got 1600 years of evidence to learn by that this is the sort of actions that they've been doing because they were doing this to the Sikh girls in this country way, way before they were doing it to the English girls they've been doing it to Sikh people Hindu people uh, in India way before they even came to England you know what I mean this has been going on forever this goes back to the times of the Raj this goes this goes back to the times of Muhammad it's not stopped it's been consistent within their religion so my my, my, well, I'll kind of know the reason behind it is the fact it's the religion that's pumping this sort of behaviour. Yeah, because like I said earlier, there's sex cases in every religion, every race. Yeah. But like you say, it's the majority. Why? Right? So with the grooming gang side of things, like they all, what's the plan and the meaning behind it? it it's disproportionate to the population where you've got, when you've got 97% of a crime being committed by 4% of the country. If anybody was supposed to be committing these sort of crimes in this country, well, well, the, the, the quota for any sort of crime in this country being committed is obviously going to be a white person because they 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 are majority of the country. That's just how it works. But when it comes to this grooming gang scandal, four percent of the country, ninety seven percent of the people committing these crimes are that four percent. Is something completely disproportionate. It's down to the fact that their religion uh, basically classes everybody as a second citizen they're supposed to submit they're supposed to bow down you're supposed to take their women as sexual slaves that's one of the ways that you get your message out there that's some that's one of the ways you rape them you impregnate them you build your army you're building more muslims that's what it's all about it's a complete totalitarian way of doing things a barbaric way of doing things but that's the way they get it done and it's not just it's not the first time in history they're just doing this right now we've got 1600 years of evidence documented evidence that they've been doing it so no no muslim can turn around and say oh we've never this has never happened before so you know what I mean what about the people who say Muslims are peaceful religion no well that's, that's ridiculous anybody who's saying Muslims are peaceful religion is a complete liar no I'm not I ain't got issues with Muslims James you know what I mean I mean I grew up in an area where you've got Sikh lads black lads there weren't really no Muslim lads around you know what I mean you've got English lads we all get on like a bloody ass on fire you know what I mean I can't turn around if I was to walk out of here and every, anybody on the street was disrespecting a Muslim woman or a Muslim child I'd smash that bloke straight in his face you know what I mean me as a man as a Sikh man you protect women you protect the vulnerable you protect the children and so it's not about the Muslim people I personally think the Muslims are the first victims of Islam. But while, as long as that ideology is going on, we're going to have to keep having these problems in our country. Their ideology does not fit in with the values that this country has, has the true Christian values, which are the same sort of values as what Sikhs have. Islam does not fit in with that. And while that's going to be here, there's always going to be that shift. There's always going to be that head knot. You could just be banging heads against the wall. And that's why we're having these negative effects on our country, on, on our streets all over this country as we speak. I think that's what's happening in Ireland. 100%, yeah, definitely. I mean, we went out to Ireland last year. We were talking about the... It, them bringing them bringing people in these left, illegal refugees are bringing them in and then we got told they were the, the irish government had done a deal with the british government and we're bringing them in from over here and we were there in killarney last we were there in dublin last friday sorry mate last february and uh, we were out there then we were talking about it they were doing demonstrations welcome all the refugees welcome all the refugees no one was paying attention to the people who actually live in the villages where the refugees are actually going to be planted and then when we went out when when tommy and the lads went out to killarney they saw the negative effect that they were having on their it, of the locals around there there were you know the girls were getting touched up the girls were getting raped blokes were getting slashed there was an old geezer in the middle of dublin he was walking his dog he's about 80 years old he got raped you know what i mean this is from the, the this is from these refugees that are predominantly coming from islamic countries and now that's why the lads have had enough of it in ireland and they're starting to really kick off and good on it's about time they should have been doing it last year when we went out there but now it's going up so thank god they're actually doing it finally i think it won't be too long until it starts happening on the streets of this country do you think it will happen here 100 percent, yeah because the amount of refugees are just letting in day in day out i mean they say the quota right now is one in 30 people is a legal refugee you know what i mean and they're just coming in out in well they're coming in and they're never leaving i've noticed it in my hometown um, i live in nottingham um, a few council areas i went to the tip yesterday and i saw some people that don't really look like the people that work at that tip and i said to one of those where are they from because oh they're from the hotels so they've even started giving them jobs now once you're giving them jobs you give them ni numbers you give them ni numbers they pay taxes you pay taxes they're making them residents and then it's like you're whacking them in hotels when we've got so many of our own that are starving can't afford to heat the house can't afford to put petrol in the car can't afford to buy food for the fucking kids and yet you're spending absolute millions on housing people that illegally shouldn't be here that shouldn't be here at all it's just crazy you know what i mean it's yeah. crazy
It's... And and then the fact of ma- the fact of the matter is, it's not just that they're a burden on our finances, on this country, country's finances. You haven't got a bloody clue who they are. It could be any old person. Look at the acid attack that we had in London not long ago. The only reason you couldn't find the acid attacker was because he wasn't documented. He had no passport. He had no mobile phone number. Nobody knew who it was. That's why it took him so long to find. And then they finally found him. He was dead in the Thames or whatever. But you, they haven't got a clue who they're bringing here. They could be any old bloody terrorist. I've seen videos of people online saying they're coming over, getting rid of the passport and they are legitimate terrorists from Islamic states. You know what I mean? And it's just absolutely ridiculous. You just open, yeah. you just open up the drawbridge for any old cunt to come through. See, I'm all for like if there's war zones and women and children need to get away, Same. by all means, let them in. And like I say, if anybody's willing to come and work and graft and yeah. bring positivity and, and do the right thing, by yeah. all means, go for it. Because I've travelled the world, I've been everywhere, yeah. and yeah. I would love to have a choice to move anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not over there fucking causing destruction. Precisely, so if you're yeah. coming here and causing that and not mm. registering yourself and like i say the health the system the healthcare system here is on its ass Messed uk up. is on its ass precisely is it, like yeah. scotland the laws and everything in scotland are a fucking mate, joke now it, and i, I thought scotland you. had a bit of balls about them no but no. it's the fucking yeah. weak i know the yeah. shit that's happening with uh, sentences for the sex cases and men dressing as fucking uh, it, it, men it's, dressing it's, it's as women and getting put in women's prisons yeah. like it's fucking sick this is just the start of you you've got undocumented people coming here there and everywhere they're letting our boys dress like girls they're letting the girls you know they're, they're te- not dress like them you want to dress like them i haven't really got an issue with that it's when you want to start cutting your nuts off and doing all the rest of it at such yeah. a young age you can't even vote but then you've got a government that's telling you yes you can do that everything's backwards and the way it seems to me it's like it's like the government and the powers that be have just pressed this like self-destruction button. Let's just fuck it all up. Let's just mess this country really up. We had it so good. When I was on the train coming down today from Nottingham, right, we passed through like Leicestershire, Market Harbour, going into Northamptonshire. You're looking over beautiful green fields, the farmers out, the kids are coming out from school playing, there's churches in the background. That's the England I know, like a nice England. In the 80s and 90s, we had it nice like that. It was nice. When I walk around nowadays, especially in the cities, it, it doesn't feel like that to me no more. It doesn't even feel safe. You know, when I came down here, I got in the taxi, um, it was in the, the, the taxi driver in the front. He goes, is that nice watch you have? I was like, yeah, yeah, I bought it the other week. He goes, what is it? I was like, hey, it's a Rolex. He goes, be careful. Be careful with that. I was like, is it really that bad? Because I didn't really believe it. He goes, be very bloody careful. I said, make sure you drop me off right outside where I'm going, mate. I'm not walking around too fucking yeah. long. You know what I mean? All the taxi drivers do say that. The I taxi know, yeah. driver we got a couple of weeks ago, his wife got robbed yeah. for their phone and their jewellery. Precisely. Yeah, it's pathetic. For something so fucking minor, they wanted to risk their own lives and somebody else's life over yeah. you fucking biscuits. And that's the thing. They've been taking, I think that last, I said, they've had the self destruction button put on this country for so bloody long. From it, um, you've had like you know th- these little these little wretches turning up in society all over the place. You know where where previously uh, there used to be a bit of honour amongst thieves. You know what I mean? We had it down in the areas where I grew up. You don't rob old ladies. You don't do that. You don't do this. It seems all that's out the window as well, and everything's just a free game. It's like some bloody sort future utopia, sadistic. It's crazy, mate. I just don't understand it at all. Do you think there's a bigger agenda behind it, or do you just think? It's um, it's just the way the world is going. I've I've heard so many different reasons. I've heard this clergy scheme, which is like the Rothschilds are trying to get everybody to mix breed to wipe out the English population. Something along them lines. Don't quote me on that. Um, I don't know what it is. I I, I think, I think personally, um, our government, the way the powers that want to be, they want this country to be as left as far left as possible. I do actually think it's being diluted, you know what I mean? And it's being diluted with mass illegal immigration. It's being diluted by factions of other ideologies that do not agree with the same Christian English values that we have being brought here by mass and, you know, being able to breed by mass and have big influence within politics. It's being diluted what's being taught to our children. And the only reason I can think that anybody would want to dilute something is to take it completely over. So if it's being diluted, you know, who and what, what for? You know, what is the further plan? I don't know, but there's something definitely not right, man. But mate. England you know I mean? and the UK would be a target. They've colonised over 90% of the planet. I know, planet. precisely, yeah, 100%. So it would be a target for people to then put things in place yeah. to target it. Mm. And like I say, I've no issues with religions. As long as you're doing good, 
then by all means I'm not asked. But the Muslim community is the fastest growing religion in the world. 100. percent Yeah, it's a totalitarian religion, and you know, since the since the days of the Prophet Muhammad, um, you know, they will convert by force or by sex jihad or by whatever. You know what I mean? And that's why I think the re the last statistics that I saw, the non-Muslim couple would breed at a rate of about 1.2, when the Islamic couple were like three point something. Uh, we had uh, talks with politicians back in the EDO days saying, you know, by the year 2050. I mean, they're only four percent right now. Could you imagine when they get to ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty-five percent, and then the sort of have it that they wreck, wreck on that sort of level? And it's like nobody can turn around to me and say, "Oh no, the Muslims here are absolutely lovely. They won't cause them sort of troubles." I'm like, "Well, you're saying that, but I see different in my communities, and I've got sixteen hundred years of history to learn about, especially where my people are from, India, where it tells me well teaches me something completely different. So I need to go back on what I know and what you actually think you presume. You know what I mean? And I think it will. Well, it's having a negative impact now, and I think it's just going to keep continuing to have that." What, the Sikhs and the Muslims, what happened there? When it came to the times of, our, I mean, our, our religion, uh, uh, Guru Nanak, I mean, I, I, I am not, I want, I want to say this clearly, I'm not, I am not an advocate. I cannot speak on behalf of the Sikh religion. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a baptized Umratari Sikh man. And so whatever I, I can tell you is just from what I've been taught, but I can never say it's gospel because I had a bit of a bollocking by some staunch Sikhs not too long ago when they say, you shouldn't have said that, you should have said that like this. So I, I am not the ultimate authority on it and I don't have the right to speak on it because I'm not. Not a, I'm not a baptized Sikh man, but what I can tell you is, uh, ba back in the day during the times of our guru, it was mainly, um, I think, I mean, it was the later on gurus, basically the Muslims, uh, Mughal Muslim Empire, they already taken over most of Asia. They were trying to take it, well, they, were, they did practically take over India, and one of the things they wanted to do was get rid of all the Hindus, because the Hindus had so many people. I mean, you speak about the Holocaust in Germany of Jews of 6 million, the biggest Holocaust in the planet was of Hindus in India of 84 million, and that was by the hands of militant Muslims and Islam. Now, our, our religion is famous because um, our ninth group, you know, n n n a number of our gurus were uh, murdered uh, by uh, militant Muslims, by uh, the Mughals. Um, our 10th guru, his children were murdered by the militant Muslims. Our 10th guru started a Khalsa army that actually went all over Asia and brought down the Mughal Muslim Empire. So we completely wiped them out and we did that so um, the oppressed could actually start to be free. So the Irish should stem back from them. When you have times of when there was partition, um, when uh, Gandhi created partition in India, and then you had all the Muslims uh, in India had to move to newfound Pakistan. The land that they traveled through was Punjab, and that's the, that's the area where Sikhs congregate. That's the Sikh land in India. When anybody asked me, are you from India? I said, well, my people, are, I don't like to say India. I always say my people are from Punjab. That's the way I see it. Um, so when, when, when the Muslims actually left India and they went to newfound Pakistan during partition, they went through Punjab, Punjab as a Sikh land it is. And, you know, we call that, we can class that as one of our holocausts. Our good followers were burned down, our women were raped, our children were raped. It was absolutely terrible. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered. So the issues with that side of India and Pakistan, they've always been warring, they've always had them issues since then. When my grandmother and their, and, and their generation came over to this country, they came over for a little bit of a free break. They said, we've had hell from the Pakistani people people here we've had hell from back in the day our people have had hell from uh, muslims with our gurus and everything we could come here under the christian rule it was it was after world war ii so they had a kind of invite because they fought for world they fought in the wars there was the biggest voluntary deployment of an army in history was the indian army which was 94 percent Sikh regiment so 94 percent of them were Sikhs, and they volunteered they they went to war voluntarily uh, without the permission of their government i think that's the way it happened that's what i've been told that's what winston churchill states and then, so when my people came here back in that in that generation, in the late uh, in the late late fifties, early sixties, mid sixties, my grandma came here and saw Pakistani people, and she's like, "Bloody hell! What, we've just tried to run away from all this. What the hell they're doing here? You know what I mean? Don't they haven't they learned from what they've done in other areas?" And obviously, my grandma says, "You know, back in them days, there was a little bit of peace and quiet among them." But what she's what she's told me, and what I've noticed is, the newer the generations become in the Muslim community in this country, the more extreme they become as well. So that's why we're at the stage that we're at right now. Yeah, because like I say, in any religion, there's good and bad, and yeah. I know many Muslim people who are top notch, solid. Yeah. But what is an extreme Muslim then? What's the difference from a Muslim to an extreme Muslim? To tell you the truth, I mean, I, that's kind. Of, to me, a Muslim, it, well, to, a Muslim to, to anyone is one that bows to his faith, okay? Um, I, I class Islam as an extremist ideology. Um, I don't see it. Be, be, the amount of peace and the amount of love and forgiveness and all the rest of it, which we all admire and, we, and our religion has actually stick to, that's based in it, is completely void in my eyes with the amount of evil and all the rest of it that's within their scripture. 
Now, when it comes to a Muslim, a Muslim is obviously, in my eyes, a follower of the faith of Islam. But when it comes to the extremist, extremist Muslims, to me, it's the people that take it a little bit more literally. And so the people that are reading them, them scriptures of hate and genocide and murder and pedophilia and rape, and they're actually agreeing with it. So that's my idea of a militant Muslim. Um, when I speak to some Muslims about it, and I've mentioned things in their scripture that um, I'm completely against, they tell me we've never even read that, don't know anything about it, like not, been, not been taught, not been taught about it themselves. And so the extremist Muslim to me is somebody who literally does take that scripture and believe in it and thinks it's correct because that is not the values we have in our country. And all you do is need to, all you need to do, all you need to be is just be a stand-up human being to not even have any of them sort of mm -hmm. beliefs beliefs within your system anyway. Did you see being an EDL and people say it's a racist organisation? Did you get any shit? Never. Or being not a once. Sikh man? Never. Not once. Uh, you see, this is the thing. When when nobody look, when somebody don't like something, they call it racist straight away. It's like blokes nowadays. Oh, he's a racist. He's a sexist. He's this, that, and the other. I mean, I mean, nowadays, I mean, in the English Defence League, uh, the first memo that they put out, it's for all religions, white, black, brown, it doesn't matter if you came here from Poland yesterday, you've been here 100 years, whatever, it's for everyone, it's against this threat of Islam and militant Muslims. Now, within the English Defence League, I'm not saying they weren't racist, they were, they were, and they were the people that me and Tommy and those lads got together, got physical with, and got bloody rid of them. And they were the factions we got rid of. We did not condone racism in any single way. There was a Blackburn demonstration that I had organised, and there was a group that we had actually already kicked out but they kept turning up to our demos and they turned up to black black blackburn demo when i was doing the de when i was doing the speech on stage they were there screaming shouting and then tommy got on stage cursed them out next minute they're in the crowd fighting ed and i think tommy actually got nicked for that for ed in one of them they don't tell you about that but when, when you're talking about racism did i see any racism i saw fuck all at all there was a faction that didn't want me there but they were the faction that weren't welcome and we got rid of and so yeah so there were some people didn't want you there because of your skin color well let's put it this way when i first started when we first got involved in the english defense league and i was on that leadership table and we were getting on nobody said nothing but when their true sort of concerns came out and they tried to move in a different direction to what we were moving and then they started acting up then you know what i mean and then maybe they would have said an insulting word about my skin color on the internet you know what i mean and then but they're the people we got rid of we got rid of you know what i mean because they were making comments like that when they were got rid of they were welcome to our demos but they did turn up now and then and that blackburn one was a perfect example where we you know managed to get the bloody hands on them and then just got rid of them once and for all what was the meaning for the demos um, a lot of the demonstrations used to have different meanings i mean uh, we used to have one in dudley and that was against the super mosque being built there was luton and that was uh, for a terrorist organization that had just been arrested uh you know so, so some demos had a lot of different meanings other demos it was to mainly just gain a bit of traction let's go down london we've got big numbers there we can make a bit of a wave let's go here we've not been there before when um, people in the, in the in the community are saying that they have concerns within the area so we'll go there so it could be for a variety of different reasons and um, it's not like what Tommy does nowadays where he's just organised a demo for central London you know we go in there I think he just organised there because it's easy for people to mobilise to it's not really that but there were always reasons behind it so it could have been for a mosque it could have been for a grooming scandal it could have been for terrorists in the area it could have been could have been for a few reasons so it was all different things yeah not, but sometimes it was just a case like the north needed a demo the north's crying out when mm. you're dealing with so many attitudes so many people like we want a fucking demo you know we want one why have we got one and so you know you do have to kind of you know help mm. them out as well and so for that reason if you've got a lot of support in one sort of area and they're trying to gain a little bit more it's good if they get a demonstration so sometimes we used to hit that sort of area but we went to let some lengths and breadths of this country all over england yeah did you know how big tommy was going to get when i when i went to prison okay when i went to prison to, tommy had ended the english fancy right mm -hmm. so uh tommy was when i spoke i spoke to tommy when, when i because when i went to prison tommy actually went to prison himself as himself as well sorry mate um he went for a mortgage fraud or something like that it, both of us went to prison kind of like the same time but he actually he didn't do too much of a big bird, but I was in there for quite a bit. So when I when I did finally manage to call him from when I was in jail, and because I had a lot of shit in jail, I was talking talking to him about it, and I was asking him things, and it didn't seem like he was planning on doing anything. You know what I mean? He was. I think he was just planning on. He's coming from jail. He's going to settle down, get a job. But then while I was in jail, then obviously um, some people may have had mobile phones in their cells and uh, they used to show me videos of Tommy doing the videos that went quite viral for uh, a rebel media out in Canada as a revance organization. And so then 
everybody on the wing started talking about, you seen that fucking Tom Robson? I'm hearing it again. I'm like, bloody hell, it's all popping off again now. I've had peace and quiet for a year. It's all been kicking off for three years. Now it's all happening again, but no good on him. So then he, then he got really, really big. Now, when I did finally come home from jail in 2017, my, um, uh, you, you know, when you, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been in prison, but when yeah. you come, when you come out, you have like your probation paperwork and it will give you all your, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that. But the, I had four pages, first seven pages, double sided, first seven pages were all, uh, keep away from Tommy Robinson, don't do no speeches, don't organise no events, don't go here, don't do that. And on the final page, it was like, oh, by the way, you know that geezer you're supposed to have tied up and battered and this and that and the other, do us a favour, keep away from him and his family. So it was nothing to do with my index offence, it was all about Tommy Robinson and the EDL. And so when I did finally come out, I couldn't actually go near Tommy. And so I couldn't contact him or ring, but I saw it blowing up on the internet. I was like, fucking get in there, lad. I'm talking to people and they're talking to him and people are saying, oh, Tommy, you spoke to Amit. I mean, maybe our words got to each other one way or another, but I couldn't actually go near him. Then after about two, three years on three years of probation, my, my probation officer finally turned around and said, look, we're taking away all them clauses anyway. So then I could finally start getting involved. But until my probation was finally over, I didn't bother going to any demonstrations or anything like that or either. Because I just thought the minute I turned up, they want, some pigs are just going to pick me up straight away and just stop me back up for some bullshit you know what i mean yeah. so i thought get probation out get five year probation out of the way properly first and then because go back you would have been getting surveillance in that anyway 100 yeah all, you was all becoming in, massive bro, on facebook I, I was going i was going I, I was going to probation once a week i was going police station one, once a fortnight i was having to go here there and everywhere my probation officer i mean usually you get your probation from one week to two weeks to a month or something like that. i was doing weekly for fucking god knows how long and then it went to fortnight Liz, and then it was only because of lockdown then that kind of reduced you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then i saw the back end of lockdown through probation and that was it but i was they had me a lot down bank account we want to check this we want to do that you need to send this in send that and it was a fucking nightmare but thank god it's all over now you know what jail did you go to i started my sentence in hmp nottingham uh from hmp nottingham i did like uh six months in hmp nottingham um I'm, I'm quite good if you put me in places that i don't know i know the sort of right people to be around and because it's nottingham it's my sort of people anyway so i got in nottingham quickly got myself into a single cell got wing barber job did six months there uh, from Nottingham, I went to HMP Ramby. I was in Ramby for like nearly a year. Uh, Ramby, I got a good job there. You know what I mean? I, I didn't even ask for it. You know what I mean? You put yourself in the right pit, in the right place. You just be the right person. Not no screw boy, but someone that the screws can rely on if they need to come to. I could get on with the inmates and I could get along with the screws. There's no fucking difference to me. And I'm not fucking bothered about either of them. And then I got a good job there. I was reception orderly, induction orderly and all that sort of stuff. So I kind of had the run of a jail. I got to do quite a lot. I had a lot of freedom there. You know what I mean? Um, I got into a couple of fights there. That kind of nearly took my job away from me. And then, but luckily, I, you know, I didn't first. This key's a graffiti in my wall. Now, he says he did it for a joke. I've got a feeling he was paid to do it by some Muslims because they're, they're, they're actually on an intelligence report that my solicitor got from that prison. The Muslims were trying to put money out there to try and get to me. But they were asking people to do it. And people were like, we ain't getting to them. We'll get to you instead. Nottingham was a place, uh, HRP Ramby was a place like in Nottinghamshire where they couldn't really quite get to me. So he's a graffiti in my wall. I went to his cell. I put it on him. He come out with a table leg. I took his table leg off and I beat the shit out of him. And then obviously I lost all my jobs. But the screw saw what happened. I went to his cell. He come out with a table like self-defense in it so you know i got my job straight back and then he just got moved to another wing and then the, and then um, when i when i did actually they did actually move me off that wing to the induction wing f wing which is kind of rough it's kind of the roughest ring i've seen in prison and then i stayed there for a bit and then there was muslims on there there was there was muslim converts black lads from up north not no pakistani lads just a few black lads pakistani lads never got on well got on well on that wing uh, they told me, they admitted to me that uh, the Muslims had tried to like put a little hit on for me, you know, like, here's 500 quid or something, get him slashed up. And the black lad was just like, we agree with everything Gorimit does, you know what I mean? So we're not going nowhere near him. And then in um, HMP Ramby, I, I was there for about just under a year. I got into a bit of an argument with one of the governors there, a new governor. I kept trying to ask about my cat D. I've got lawyers on the outside working on it. I'm paying lawyers on the outside to work on it. And then I had got into a bit of a ding dong with her. Then I got, I called her a fucking peasant. I shouldn't have done it, you know what I mean? But I just called her a fucking peasant. And then she sent me to Stockholm, and that's where shit got really bad. Do you know what I mean? I was in Stockholm. I got into Stockholm, and then um, I got into the induction wing. All of a sudden, my name's a lie. Uh, Stockholm is majority Pakistani Muslims. That prison is just full. It's, if you've got a po population of 1,000 people, you look at 750 people, 750 Pakistani Muslims. Uh, the, the dynamics of it are crazy, because it's, it's in Rutland. It's right next to Leicester. So Pakistani Muslims have got a, quite a big, you know, quite a big following there. 
So I went there, then they put me um, on the induction wing, then I got a job in the equality mentor class. I was all right. One of the Muslims tried to attack the teacher there. So I basically just turned around, took the chair out of it, moved him out of the way, kept make sure she was all right. And then my name started getting a buzz. Oh, Gurmit Singh's down, education kicking off for Muslims. This and the other one, like, bloody hell. Then they, then they had me on induction wing. I said to screw that. I was working with my lawyer as well on the phone daily. I'm like, look, you need to get me out of there because this is, get me out of it because this is where it's 100% going to kick off. So my lawyer's trying to approach other prisoners, trying to get me out of there work something out and then they moved me onto another wing and the minute they moved me onto that wing with my pad mate i walked in and you got like 10 50 muslims on the floor just praying and there's just like a gate so they opened this gate pushed me and locked the gate i turned around they smoked to me just walked off i thought fuck you know because me being there was a problem for the screws because the screws they just want a peaceful prison and the people that are running that prison are the pakistani muslims so the pakistani muslims are complaining about me so that's causing them problems so the screws didn't have my back and so they put me on that wing um john boy went outside there was a couple of lads on that wing that they knew john boy went outside to ex ex it was lunchtime ex exercise john boy went off the wing to go and get a couple of bo uh, bo uh, bestwood lads that we knew they were on that wing outside i went to go and get my lunch and went back to my cell i thought i'm not just gonna fucking hide in my cell i can't just hide here keep the door locked because if something's going to happen, a robbery just fucking happen straight away. But I knew it was coming. When I went to get my lunch, there was this convert there. Yeah, we're going to fucking get you this, that, and the other. And there's a screw sat right next to him. Screw didn't do nothing. Giggling, signing me off. Cal, all right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Didn't do fuck all. Two-tier two police and two-tier judging. You know what I mean? Two tier, two, it's a two-tier system within the prison network as well in this country. You know what I mean? So that happened. I went to my cell. Then the minute I went to my cell, there was a knock on the door. I opened the door. About fucking 10 of them come running in. Just jumped all over me. Got a little knife mark on my head. Got a black eye. Fucking a couple of stamp marks and stuff. Nothing too bad. I'm going to bust my lip a little bit. But the thing is, I hadn't seen my family. I saw my family once in Rambi. I didn't, I didn't really think the prison was the best place for my mum and my little brother to come visit me. My grandma was too poor. Since I went to prison, my grandma had like three, four mini strokes. You know what I mean? She never had a stroke before. And uh, I didn't think it was the best place for her to go. But my brother and my, brother and my father and my mother come visit me in Rambi like once. And then, so that's like a year and a half, and that's they've only visited me once, so they're about to visit me in Stockholm. Then I had to ring them up and say, oh, I've been shipped to another jail, so there's no point coming there. So they didn't bother coming. And then I did like six months in Stockholm. After that, it got a bit, a little bit fucking hairy a few times. One of my best friends, uh, God bless him, I'll tell you about him in a bit. I'm <laughs> fucking miss him so much. <laughs> if there was one bloke I wanted to ring today, it would have been him. <coughs> Sorry. JT passed a few years ago and I was on the wing one time and I was like proper alone because when you're in there you just by yourself you've got no one there was other lads saying yeah Gurmit we'll back you I'm like if you back me I know I'm going to be out of here one day you're going to be in the shit yourself so just leave me to it and I rung him one night and he fucking the sort of man he was I mean you've had you've had similar men on this show I mean I've seen your uh, podcast like Vic Dark and Stephen Friend he's on that sort of level he's one of them and then he told me, get your fucking head up. What, you're fucking EDL, EDL, this, that. And you, you fucking sort it out. Start fucking these cunts up. He put a little bit of fire in me that got me through the next few months in Stockton. You know what I mean? Because I didn't, my, my, my mentality weren't in a great place. You know what I mean? It wasn't at all. I never, I never contemplated committing suicide, but you definitely think about it sometimes and you think, no, that ain't the right thing. You know what I mean? But yeah, it was, it was a bad situation. But then from Stockton, they moved me to Wayland. So I why did, did they put you in there anyway? Was that set up to get you killed? Well, th th because Tommy they, why was else? put in. Why Tommy else? was put in with the guys who try and fucking kidnap them. Mate, mate I, I was in Ramby, all right? I was induction orderly, uh, reception orderly, so in jail. That's the biggest job ever. I was running around all over the place. There's Muslims trying to get to me. They couldn't get to me. I was fucking safe. In HMP Nottingham, even though I was only there for six months, you know what I mean? There's a couple of rumours about me. I was fucking safe. I could have done my whole bird there. For, fuck the cat D, I'm safe there. Because the thing with me, it was wasn't a case james of just doing the five years and getting home the case of me is getting home fucking alive you know what i mean i'm no good going home i'm going home in a body bag what good am i going to be to my family then you know what i mean and so that that was the plan for me like get home in one fucking piece i always had it in the back of my head to work towards this cat d because i thought i think i may be able to get that so get that was home. my idea get home a little bit quicker get home for the last two years so then so then that happened at stock and then finally they moved me but they moved me to fucking wayland now wayland's like taking me out of the oven and putting me in the frying pan so it got even worse. And like I said, the screws at Stockholm, the, the Stockholm governor come to me. He said, get out of your cell now. If you don't, I'm getting all your shit, all your clothes and stuff. And it takes years to assemble this stuff in prison. I'm going to chuck it all in the fucking bin and you'll be on that bus no matter what. I don't give a fuck about your problems with the EDO. You're causing dramas here. I didn't cause no dramas. I ain't been going out assaulting nobody. Because of what happened to me, there was a few people from Nottingham that started on some Muslims and messed them up on other wings. But that's because they're probably just sticking up for a Nottingham lad, you know what I mean? But I'm not telling anybody to do anything. I didn't do nothing wrong. I don't graft on the wing. I ain't making no money. I ain't borrowing no, I ain't doing no drugs. I don't do nothing. I've got my shit together. I don't need anything. I just need to get the fuck home. So that happened in Stockton. 
And then obviously they moved me to Wayland. And like I said, that's like taking you out of the oven and putting you in the fucking frying pan. The minute I walked on that wing, I thought, I'm fucked, proper fuck. But luckily, there's, nobody knows me there. It's, it's, North, it's out in Norfolk, Thetford. It's an East North London, it's an East London, North London ship out. It's a lot of gang members and stuff. So I got there. And then I got on. To, I, got, I was on the induction wing for about two weeks. Had to work with some screws there. They were like, "We've got no security report. All your security report has been held behind at Stockton." So Stockton sent me without sending the security report about me. Like, what about? I said, "Let me sit you down and tell me my situation. What's happened?" Then they went out and found out from the previous prison. It's like even the governor. Well, not governor free strike. Custody manager, custodial manager came down to me. He said, "What the fuck are you doing here?" I said, "I fucking know. What the fuck am I doing here? I'm from Nottingham. I'm in bloody Norfolk. You know what I mean? And this is the worst place to have me." And then what happened in, so I was there for about four or five months. And then what happened there, I was getting on, I was doing all right. I was working in education. I was teaching Muslims how to read. I'll teach anyone how to read. They're all the same people to me. I'm not bothered about your religion or your color or anything. You're all the same to me. I just have an issue with Islam. That's my thing. And then, uh, and then what happened there was a screw came to me in the middle of the night and they're like, is everything been all right with you? I was like, why? Why do you ask? They said, we've had a bit of intelligence. I was like, why? There they were planning something sadistic. It's a it's a sadistic. They got 21,000 pounds together to fucking put a hit on me. And I was like, oh, 21 grand, is that it? You know what I mean? So I started having a chat with this screw and I was like, I've been seeing over the last few days, things have been changing. People have been looking at me differently. There's been rumors. Usually when people are smiling, they're not smiling. I could see something happening myself, but I couldn't quite put my finger in it. The minute she said that, I was like, I get it now. She got, I said, my name's out there again. And that was after that, being there for about three, four months. Some people had arrived from Stockton and told everybody who I was. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't really feel like them Pakistani Muslims in Stockholm. They don't really bother me. But when I'm dealing with these converts from North East London gang, gang, gang members and all that sort of shit, I know they've got a little bit more about them. They're willing to do stupider things just for the hell of having a reputation of they managed to fuck up government thing. I know that for a fact. And so from there, they moved me onto the open wing. So when they did move me onto that open wing, I was like, fucking bingo. This is where everybody starts going home. Um, across the road, Rodney, there was like this money migration guy, billionaire, Roger. Two doors down, there was Kenneth Noy, that brink smack guy. There were some serious people on there. And so they, ha they had me on that induction wing. And then after I was there for a month or two, I couldn't go religious studies. That was the same as Stockton. I couldn't go religious studies, couldn't go education, work or anything. Same what happened to Wayland. I had to sit on the wing, couldn't do nothing. I misbehaved, I had done nothing wrong. Can't have visits. Because if something, I had one visit in Wayland and I heard some, no, in Stockton, sorry. And I heard some Muslims, because I can understand their language, talking about how they're going to try and attack my, me and my family. And so I said to I said, screw, get me back to my wing now. And then, well, not my, my family, me and my mates. I said to screw, get me back to the wing now. And I told my mates, just get the fuck out there now because we're all planning it there and then so, so i didn't have visits from like stockton to wayland and then i got to the open wing and long story short i managed to get a fucking cat d so bingo um i told him don't send me to a local cat d because there's going to be a lot of people in the area that know me especially a lot of muslims and stuff and they're not going to attack me in the cat d but they're going to get my name put it in the box every day saying he's a drug dealer this sort of shit that sort of shit and so i knew what was coming so they managed to get me up to Kurt Lev, which is uh, in uh, Yarm in uh, the in um, in the northeast. So when I got there, you know, that was the first time in like two and a half years I actually finally got well, three and a half years, sorry, I actually got a little bit of peace and quiet. I cried my eyes out when I got there. They had some influential governors and screws at the wing waiting for me for when, for when I arrived, and they kind of patted me on my back and said, "Yeah, we got you back now, son. We got you back now, lad." The officers in, and the governors in Wayland they proper helped me out as well. They're the ones that got me up there. You know what I mean? Got me somewhere safe instead of just passing me around the block into whatever old shit hole they could put me in. So yeah, I got up there, then started working, and then I, I was working for this influential family up there. And um, yeah, then I kind of learned a bit about the business from people up there. Then I started buying houses up there and stuff when I came home in 2017. And then I've been building the business since then. I mean, it's not a lot, but you know, I'm still going. I've got some other things up my sleeve which are coming to fruition now as well. So hopefully this time next year, we should be in a whole different place, Rodgers, you know what I mean? So you had the hat out in your head because yeah. you were a knee deal with Tony? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, 21,000 pounds, I said. I said, what a weird figure. She goes, what it is? She goes, I'll just be running their mouths about it. I said, how about I start putting 20 grand on people's, that was the argument I got into it. How about I whack 20 grand on people's heads and I've got it to fucking give. I'm not just going to talk it on the wing. Go and make calm down, don't do that. I was like, well, someone help me out. I'm in the shit here. I've been in the shit since I've left bloody Rambi. So I've been like a year and a year and a half in the complete shit. Sort me out. So that happened, but mate, if it wasn't for that so-called hit, I wouldn't have got onto that open wing. And if I wouldn't have got on that open wing, I wouldn't have done my last year and a half in fucking Kurt Lev in Cat D. Within like three, four months, I got to Kurt Lev. I started going home, one day release, and then four or five days um, a month. You know what I mean? So it's a bit of a gift and a curse that so-called assassination attempt was, yeah.
Did you think you were going to die in there? Hundred percent. Yeah, I thought in Stockholm. I thought in Stockholm it's coming. I thought in Wayland that'll be the one. Yeah, yeah. Because I thought because at first when I got to Wayland I thought this will be the place. If it's going to happen, it will be in this place. But then I had a bit of a nice run in there and nothing happened. So then it all calmed down and then it all just flared back up again. And I thought shit. But it would have been Wayland if it was going to be anywhere. Definitely, my mate. Yeah, because when Tommy was on the podcast, I think a year, two years ago, when yeah. he just got out. They put him in with the people who were trying to set him up to kill him. It's ridiculous. And like I say, whether, whether you agree with Tommy or not, yeah. you've got to think Tommy was at the swimming. Yeah. And men groped his daughter's ass. And they arrested him. And they arrested Tommy. I know. It's so, like, it's that's so fucking crazy. It's so backwards. I mean, when you've got a bloke like me, you've got hundreds of prisons throughout this country, well, I'll be fucking safe. You know that I've got a bit of history with Tommy Robinson and the English Defence League. You know that I've been assaulted in these prisons. You know these attacks are getting more serious and serious. Do your duty of care. Do what you're paid to do. The very cornerstone of a prison officer and a prison governor's business is duty of care to the inmate, regardless of your opinion and of this, that, or the other. Nobody upheld it that. In Stockton and Wayland, in, St in Stockton, nobody, in, really at the end of Ramby, nobody upheld it. In Stockton, they didn't uphold it. I got to Wayland, they didn't know who the fuck I was. Then they actually pulled their fingers out and did something right. So not all these screws are bad. But in that period there, Wayland was just like, what the fuck, what are you even doing here? What am I doing in Norfolk? They had this, they had this I can't remember what the word's called, but in them days, they had this rule where you had to stay to your local area. So I was supposed to stay in the East Midlands, not go nowhere. What the hell am I doing for Norfolk? It's stupid. So why are you putting me in with these gang members on an extreme sort of level? You know what I mean? But did that, did that fuel, though, your hate towards Muslim men? What do you mean? Like being in prison and try to terrorise you, try to kill you. Did no, because my feel... my opinions on militant Muslims have always been there, regardless of prison or not. They've been in me since I was a kid. You know what I mean? I've seen how Muslims act on the streets of this country, militant Muslims, and you know, and 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 a bit of harder factor of Muslims. That's been I, I've witnessed that since ten years old. Or all, all that happened to me in prison was just solidified it again. Yeah, well, you know what they're like. You know what's going to happen. They're not just going to sit here and let you do your justice in peace, like you do your burning peace, isn't it? It's going to come. But you know, I was ready for it to come, but it just gets you. Down you know when you're in there you're fucking trying to fight it all your fucking self you've got no one to talk to you've got no one to lean on those people from Nottingham they used to like avoid me on the wing because they didn't want to be seen talking to me in case one of the Muslims was like oh you've been talking to fucking Gurmit Singh you know what I mean this that and the other uh -huh. and so yeah so it's a bit of a weird one but you know luckily I come out and since I have been out I'm on the straight and narrow. I'm not being funny. I, I don't even cross the road unless a green man's fucking flashing nowadays. I'm not willing to get in nothing naughty no more. I'm not putting myself in them positions no more, my friend. Life's going well now, so I must keep at it. Good. But 2024, the prisons are run by Muslim boys. Oh, 100%. Yeah, the majority of the one now. Yeah. Because back in the day, what you had in the prison system is you had your dispersal prisons, which are your, which are your ACATs, your, your Franklins, your Whitemores, your, uh, your Belmarshals, all this. They used to call them dispersal prisons because you had gangs of gangsters down in London or Birmingham or Nottingham getting caught and they didn't want them in the same prison. So they disperse them. And that's why they disperse all these gang members all over the country. What's happened now, what's been happening for the last previous few decades, it's not been criminal gangs that have been dispersing, it's been terrorist cells that have been dispersing. So now these cells, cells have got out there and then you've got these militant Muslims that have had a foothold in these cat a jails and they're being and they're in there and they're preaching their extremism and that's growing and they're forcing people to convert in there when i was in Wayland, bro i saw scottish people that converted i was like what the fuck when i was in stock and i saw i, I saw travelers that are converted there's a traveler coming with me because i'm converting they get an easy life i thought you fuckers were staunch because catholics you know what i mean what the fuck's going on here i couldn't believe it couldn't be you leave my eyes there was P polish people that are converting to Stockholm because i get why they're doing it the week and they want an easy time you know what i mean in Wayland, if you were in there for a sexual offence paedophilia or something like that you'd convert to Islam because no one's touching you then you know what I mean why because because when, down the southern prisons that wouldn't happen well, up man, in the northern the prison yeah, man, you be fucking done, yeah 100% uh, the, yeah there was many on the wing there were paedophiles there was a geezer that raped his uh, little sister on the wing and they convert to Islam so nobody could touch him no one could touch him and then the Muslims on the wing would leave like drugs in his cell and then he'd be holding the drugs and no one could go near him and we used to talk about it. I used to be there with the English lads and the Jamaican lads talking about oh you fuck this cunt up you know what I mean they're like you do that then the whole wing's going up you know what I mean we're all fucked you know what I mean it's crazy but down there literally it, in, 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 when I was in HMP not, not in a, I was waiting to uh, for surgery one day they let me out a little bit early to help out to give all the sweets and the snacks out um, on your, your canteen you know what I mean on a Friday or whatever or Saturday and then there was an imam and he walked past he said hello and he went on to the nonsense wing which was next door to our wing and he put a flyer under every single fucking cell on that nonsense wing then he walked off he didn't put them on our wing you know what I mean but just on the nonsense wing because that's when people are vulnerable and when people are vulnerable you'll catch them and that's when you'll convert them and that's how the numbers are being built it's another sort of way of Islam you know for, you know, getting its, getting its fingers out there you know what I mean that's what's the worst I mean. thing you've seen in prison? 
when Giza next door to me, uh, I discovered his dead body in HMP Nottingham. Um, he had cancer. His, his family used to uh, protest outside the um, prison every day. Um, I went to his cell one day. Cookie, my mate Cookie was in my cell. I went to his cell just before um, everything was locking off. I'd get some Rizzlers. I'd run out Rizzlers. And then I opened the door, shoved, shoved it. I was like, what the fuck's going on here? There was a bit of like cloth at the top. I shoved it open. And then I just seen this body fall in front of me. And I was like, I just knew straight away. I was like, he's dead. I've never seen a dead human being in my life. I've seen someone close to being dead, but not dead like that. And I was like, that fucking moved me. They got me quickly. I told the screw show. I was like, fucking hell. They got me quick. Whacked me in my cell. Cookie was still in there. Then the coppers had to come. Cookie was in my night all, in my cell all night. Coppers had to come, question us and stuff like that. But I've seen people, one of my best mates, um, uh, there was a few people in Ramby, um, they were from out of town, Brighton, and they took his mobile phone. And he's only a little lad, but he's the most dangerous motherfucker in Nottingham you ever come across. If you ever hear that name, you better pack your bags and fucking run a mile. Me and him were padded up together in Stockton. We came from Ramby to Stockton together, and he cut somebody to pieces. I've never seen anything like it. The, the geezer had to hold his face together with a fucking towel just to get down the stairs. His face was completely annihilated. And people people get so fucking angry and violent in prison. It could be over the little things. It could be over like 10 pounds worth of burn or something like that. But you see like people getting kettled and stuff like that. That was quite, that used to happen quite a lot on the way, especially in Rambi. I've never seen anything as violent as what I've seen in Rambi. Every day when the association opened up, bam, they'd have an ambulance outside and then all of a sudden it was just fucking hellfire. You've got lads running around trying to get a bit of money together to pay the debt. They owe. You've got the drug dealers running around trying to get trying to get the money and then they won't get the money and the next minute it's hot kettles, it's knives, it's this, that, the other. And I was sat there with a few of my mates looking, thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? You know what I mean? So, yeah, so you always see all that bullshit. But that dead body, that always, that, that still sits a little bit in me. It was horrible to see him like that. He was a good bloke as well. He was a sound bloke. What do you think the UK's biggest threat is the now? Islam. Is that what you think it is? Yeah, the ideology as a whole, yeah. I think it, I think it's Islam and weak leadership. That's why I think the biggest threat to our uh, to our society and to our children has been the weak leadership. It has been weak government. It has been it has been a weak educational system, and uh, and I think um, the biggest threat to and I think once everything is watered down and the threat of Islam really really does actually spread its tentacles, it will be a lot easier for them to have a lot more influence on all of us. And so that's so I think it I, the both of it goes hand in hand the the extremist Islam rule. Um, because what, once you've got weak leaders and extremist Islam comes along, the extremist Islam is just going to walk straight through it. We've got extremist MPs right now that are in our houses of parliament, people that are extreme Palestine, Palestine terrorist supporters that are, that are taking the oath and are now MPs. So it's happening bit by bit. And that's coming from weak leadership. If you've got weak leadership, you wouldn't let people like this into your bloody House of Commons, your bloody epicenter of democracy for the whole world, would you? It's ridiculous. So yeah, so it comes in hand in hand with me. How was it when Tommy was getting cancelled? Were you around them then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, I, we were the first people to get cancelled before cancel was even a thing. Um, when, when, back in the back in the days when I come out of the English Offensive, like 2011, I was getting cancelled then. But but, but cancelled then was on Google. So if you googled your name, nothing would come up. And so he was getting cancelled and all that stuff then. And then the silence thing, which actually comes from his silence books, which you can buy on Urban Scoop. Yeah, that's just Tommy's books, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of books here. J James has been an absolute gentleman. He says I could plug them for him. So when I mentioned his name, might as well put them in. You've got Enemy of the State, the first one that he wrote. And then you've got Silence, the book that tells you about how he was silenced, how basically he was taken off all social media platforms. And then you've got Muhammad's Quran, which is his interpretation of Muhammad's Quran put in the uh, relevant order. But him being... Uh, cancelled in, in, in his area of being cancelled was being taken off social media having all your accounts ripped so basically your reach has gone from millions to zero but now you've seen the complete polar opposite I mean because since Elon Musk has given him his Twitter back now we're seeing something completely different when we've been going to the uh, demonstrations in Telford for the Telford grooming scandal them documentaries he's been doing Rape of Britain which you can watch on urbanscoop.news as well um, the, dem the numbers weren't that great. They were a little bit shocking. Sometimes it's upsetting to see that. We used to have them days and not in the English Defence League back in the day when you turn up and you've only got like, you know, 500 there when there should be like 10,000. Um, but now Elon's given him his Twitter back. I mean, you've seen what happened on June the 1st in London and now you've got the next demonstration at Trafalgar Square, 27th of July, not this Saturday, next Saturday. Now he's got that reach again. I think last time when they were live streaming, they had nearly a million people watching their live stream on his Twitter. 
So this time I was with Nam the other day at a funeral. Nam was saying to me that we're going to try and beat one million this time. And I reckon he's definitely going to do it. My DMs have been absolutely filled with people saying we're going to come, we're going to bring our families, we can't wait. So it's kind of like the uprising is happening again. So I'm hoping this one's going to gain quite a bit of momentum, the definite momentum we're going to need to actually fight back everything that our people don't agree with. How hard does that, like you say, 11th of June, peaceful protest, but before the protest, it's all hooligans, it's all racists, they you, cause trouble, they fight. What do you Last mean? month, the media portray it yeah. as a hate campaign, complete and racists lies. and complete football lies. hooligans. Complete lies. Yes, and football it, lads come. What? So people who support football can't come to the demonstration. You know what I mean? Someone who may have been involved in a football firm years ago, they can't go to a demo. Of course they can. Any, anybody who shares the same sort of sympathies that we share is welcome to the demo. The, the media, James, I, I know completely what you're talking about because I saw it myself. They lied so fucking goddamn much. Hooligans kicking off fighting. 500 people were there. You know what I mean? The amount of bullshit they came out with and it just shows you what agenda do these people have where they won't even give the truth to their own nation. The people that are, you know, especially like the BBC where you're paying their salaries, the tax money, and they won't even give the truth to the people. It's complete lies. It's a, it's a day out, family friendly event. And the thing is, to prove that it's all complete lies, it was lies stream to a million people and the video is available on urbanscoop.news and tommy robinson's twitter so everyone can watch for themselves what it was and you'll see that everything you've heard about racism hooliganism this that and the other it's all complete bullshit yeah it's mad when i call tommy a racist like <laughs> i had tommy on was it last year with mo yeah mo was um, falsely accused by the young girl saying that she was groomed and raped and beaten by hammers and she fabricated everything. The young Is this girl, that girl up here? Yeah, the young, girl, the young girl got eight, nine years. Tommy went to see Mo. I know, and yeah. And Mo was terrified because obviously they found yeah. of who, who Tommy was. Yeah. Tommy was the only man who helped him. Tommy saved his man's life. I know, precisely. And his family yeah. life. His, yeah. his sons were suicidal. Mo was suicidal. I know, precisely. You get and Tommy you, saved the guy's I mean, life. I mean, women can absolutely ruin men's reputations. And yeah. it's, just, it's just shocking. I mean, that's one circumstance where you find out the girl that's been caught for complete fabric these offences to her and she's gone to prison for it but just, ima just imagine the amount of women out there that have actually got away with actually the fabricated lies on men and stuff like that and, men and good men have suffered hard for it so that's absolutely incredible that Tommy went up there to help him you know what I mean absolutely yeah. brilliant mate because when I had him on about two years ago yeah. I just got out of prison he was kind of deflated yeah, yeah, yeah. never had any social media never had Twitter he was kind of still trying to fight he was up against the BBC and yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of big corporations it's hard but yeah. now he's got his Twitter back he's like 150 million views a month I know 100% he's mate. all over the place he's just done an interview with Jordan Peterson I know yeah I was supposed to be out in Canada as well with him I mean I actually had my ticket booked and everything and then when I saw him get arrested I thought I'm not fucking going out there now because I thought they were just going to chuck him in jail and bring him back here and then a week later they let him travel i thought bloody yeah. hell i should have gone but he's getting but, a lot of shit online as well because he's becoming popular again where people are coming forward saying he's done this he's a coke kid he's this he's that it's gonna happen but isn't it and the thing is is tommy i mean i've had this conversation with him he, he knows what to expect it's happened in the past it's gonna happen again it's like anything in life when you start getting a little bit of you're getting that bit of snowball effect and you're getting bigger and better what i've always noticed james with my life is you know where I'm, whenever i'm doing something and it's actually moving forward positively that's when shit starts getting a little bit more harder they start especially with some outside influences that are trying to disrupt the path that i'm on or this that or the other they may talk shit about it, they may hate it, they may just not like me and the way I'm going, but everything starts crumbling when things do start getting better. And this is this is precise, complete, this is the perfect example with Tommy Robinson as well. Everything's flying for him. The demonstrations are huge on a scale I've never seen. When we were on stage on that last demonstration at 1st of June, I whispered in Tommy's ear, I said, EDL never pulled these numbers. I said, this is something completely different. This is not EDL. This is not what Tommy's done before. This is on a whole fucking different scale. And that's coming from a bloke that used to organize the events for the English Defence League, so I know what I'm talking about with it. And, but, but with it, there's going to be outside factions that are going to try and drag you down. And then one of them factions are going to be people talking about you being a racist, you being a football hooligan, this, that, and the other, trying to drag up dirt from the past. They can't taste, say anything about your present or your future, so they bring up shit from the past to try and throw some mud at you to see it, it sticks. But luckily, people are more intelligent than to look at all this bullshit and know that, you know, to look at this bullshit and just know that it is complete bullshit and turn up on the 27th of July and just work it, all out, work it all out for themselves. What do you, do you see a difference from 2009 to now with 
You're saying the Muslim side of things, the Muslim community, do you see a lot more extremists or is it calmed down? I, I see a lot I see a lot more extremists. I, I see I, I see one thing that the English Defence has done, which we're hundred percent proud of, is they've given people a platform to be able to talk about Islam. Before the English Defence League, nobody would dare speak, say a word about it. After the English Defence League, you had politicians within the House of Commons standing up, um, you know, talking about Islam, mentioning militant Muslims. You saw you saw people like Andrew Chowdhury and other terrorists that we screamed and shouted about getting arrested, getting arrested and getting thrown in jail. Jail. I do think there's been a little bit more, a lot more action when it comes to militant, when it comes to Islam and militant Muslims. But I do believe the problem is getting worse and worse. And the reason I believe that is you've only just seen the tip of the iceberg, I think, when it comes to the amount of grooming scandal arrests they've been, the amount of cities they have been. Also, you're also getting this mass, you know, undocumented, undocumented illegal immigration from Islamic State from all over the world. So God knows what they're bringing in. So I actually think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Our counterterrorism have already stated London is not safe for Jews to walk in. You've got people running around and they're allowed to run around flying Palestinian flags flags um, in, in support of Hamas, which is a prescribed terrorist organization that goes around murdering babies and kidnapping women. You know what I mean? So it is getting worse and worse in my sort of eyes. And I think it is going to get keep, keep getting worse until there is an absolute, you know, a, a movement to completely change the way that the government think. I, mean, I think the English fancy back in the day changed the way the government thought a little bit. I think this new movement, hopefully that puts some pressure on, but look at the government we're dealing with now and what are they willing to do, if anything at all? How important are these rallies? Are very important. How because, sure? Be, be, because my, the reason why these rallies are important, number one, it gives everybody a place, a space to go to, to liaise, to socialise, and to interact with like-minded people. You're not the only ones out there. There's other people that feel the same grievances that you do. And also, it's a pressure point for the government. You cannot deny these rallies. When June the 1st, and you had all them people marching down Whitehall to Parliament Square, I was with them. I led at the front. What I saw that day, nobody can deny that. Right outside Westminster Palace, when they right, right outside Big Ben, Queen Elizabeth Tower, when people are looking out and they see this mass people all of a sudden come from nowhere um, out for these grievances that they keep speaking about, they have to start paying attention. And it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And the more people that hit the street, um, eventually, the more pressure it will start putting on government and more people will have in their areas to put pressure on their local MPs to start hopefully having some sort of voice about the concerns that we share. Do you think Tommy's becoming too big again? Because they've put him in prison, they've cancelled him. People now talk about the three strikes thing where it potentially could be dead. The, 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 I mean, you know, the, you always have this thing about the three strikes and you're dead thing. I mean, we heard a lot about it. You saw what happened with Donald Trump recently, how he nearly got murdered. I mean, God bless that man. Um, I think Tommy's Tommy's always had that level of where he's been at. But I just think that his spread's getting a lot more out there. He is big and... Where his future lies it can only be answered by Tommy Robinson. But what I do know about that man is that man will keep leading and he's he's relentless and he's going to keep fighting until the job is done. So I think the only thing that would ever take him out is a bullet. But to tell you the truth, bro, there's so many of us standing in front of him, no bullet's going to get near him while those lot are around as well. You know what I mean? So he's getting big, he's getting out there. And I think everybody around him is going to make sure this time around he's protected enough to be able to get out there to get the job done so all our future generations can live in, safe, in safety and harmony. How does one man like Tommy gather over 100,000 people in the streets. How is that possible? Well, back in the days when it came to the English Defence League, the way that we mobilised people is we had like Facebook, so basically you'd have like a Nottingham division or a Derby division or whatever, then you had the central Facebook account and it was in the, interlinked, so the message got out there. The way it's happening now is you've got Tommy Robinson, you've got the organisations that work alongside him, such as UrbanScoop.News, you've got a variety of journalists out there that are using their platforms to spread his word and spread the message and talk about the grievances that we all share. And then you've got his Twitter account, like you said, that's getting out to 150 million people a month. Last, last uh, The last demonstration on 1st of June, nearly uh, 950 thousand people watching on the live stream the next one they're going for a million so it's all these different factions that are coming in and getting the message out there and the message is getting bigger and bigger and bigger i know from the first of june like i said myself there's been a lot of people approaching me saying we're definitely coming to this demonstration we're bringing our family this that and the other so i know even my mates are turning around and saying we're coming down we're getting a train down so i know it's going to get bigger and better so after this demonstration the next one will be even bigger and better and it and it's going to be word of mouth and it's going to be the twitter and it's going to be the journalism and that, it's, it's going to be a few different factors but it will keep getting bigger a lot bigger i know well, that for a fact it's gaining momentum 
the, the, the British line as it want to see because definitely woken up. It's woken up, it's stirring now. I think on 27th of July it will start roaring and then I think you'll see a real big change. I think you'll see a real shift into something a lot more bigger. So hopefully you can get down there, my brother, to experience it for yourself. With the, the demos and um, taking to the streets, what is it you're trying to create? What changes is you're trying to make? What is it you're trying to put in place? There's, I mean, Tommy's made a few demonstrate, a, a few uh, various videos uh, recently. He's had the Rape of Britain videos. He's had the Silence video. He's had Lawfare video. I mean, originally, when me and Tommy come from, we come from a movement where we're against Islam, we're against the threat of militant Muslims and, and the negative, negative impact they're having on, on our communities. So that's one of the main reasons. We believe Islam is, a, is the be-all and ultimate threat on our future civilization. Um, you've got issues when it comes to the two-tier policing that we're against. It's one rule for the Muslims, it's a different rule for us. It's one rule for he, one rule for thee. So there is a various factions of, of, of reasons why we are demonstrating. But the number one thing is, I mean, come on, bro, we live in Great Britain, we live in the epicenter of democracy for the whole world. We want our people to be free, we want them to be righteous, we want them to be taken care of, we want uh, our future generation to be able to grow up in a safe, secure country. It seems like the government aren't doing any of that. So everything that we're crying about and we're raising awareness at these demonstrations is to basically achieve that at the end of the day. Because I spoke to someone, they said they'll try to weaken the, mon the monarchy. Not Muslims, Who? but just... And I think, was it Americans maybe? The CIA were putting plants everywhere to yeah. try and weaken, like you say, with the Queen dying. Oh, and yeah. Megan, mm. Meghan Mark hooking out with Harry, the, the yeah. brothers splitting up. There's, there's, always, um, there's, always, there's always There's always theories. conspiracy theories, this yeah. and that, but... I mean, we're, I'm a royalist, but the, I'm a but royalist. The, but the UK is on its ass. Yeah, 100%. It's on its fucking it, it many, ass. It the weather's shite, 40% <laughs> tax. It's beautiful today. Yeah, it's beautiful you know, for, yeah, for yeah. ones, but... There's just a lot of things changing. Yeah, and, um, and, and that's what I'm talking about. From when, I, from when my, like I was saying earlier, from when my younger days, when I was about, it was a different place we were living. It was a nicer place. It was a lot more. Everything was a lot more hospitable. It's all changing in a negative way. And I do, and I believe it is down to weak leadership. I believe it is down to Islam and the factions of militant and the actions of militant Muslims in certain areas. I, I believe all of these things coincide. So there's a few different reasons what we're screaming and shouting about and what we're gaining support for, and other people out there are gaining support for other reasons. You know what I mean? Hopefully there'll be a good, there'll be a, a, a mass amount of people that come together that can all work together to spread the word together to use various platforms to get the get everything to, to, to get their opinions and their and their worries out there and the concerns out there to the masses and build this organisation even up more and more and more. Has Muslim men ever came to any of the rallies for discussions or one-on-one -on -one chats? Or? No. Not that I know of. No, None? no. There's a difference. If uh, me and Tommy went to a Muslim rally, uh, a, a Muslim rally, uh, we would be assaulted. Uh, we'd be we'd, we'd be spat upon. Uh, we'd probably end up in hospital. If a Muslim came to one of our rallies, nothing would happen to him at all. Nothing would happen to him at all. A few people probably say, "What are you doing there?" Especially if they're there to cause any issues. Back in the day in EDL, we had a Muslim lad, Edi Al Abdul. He was from Glasgow. Uh, he used to come to a couple of rallies. He did a speech once or twice. You know what I mean? I hadn't heard from him for a long time. But apart from that, no, I've not heard of anybody else coming to rallies like that. No. It's just mad. Is if uh, if the world could be at peace, if it could be at one, if there was no pain, yeah. if there was no misery, it's a. Uh, it's one of them, mate. But there is a way of getting there. There is a you, 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 you got to stay strong. You got to keep moving forward. You know what I mean? We've all got to work together. And and there are negative factions in this country that we need to get rid of to move forward. And that's what we're all about, really. That's the whole point of us. Would you say there was any positives f for being Muslim? Would you say there was any positives? Oh, 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 oh the positive for Muslim people is they have the absolute. They have, they've got the run. Of, they've got the run of it. Uh, they can absolutely run them up. They can do whatever they want, and they get away with absolute bloody murder. Literally, literally get away with absolute murder. That's their positive. The only way I can see it. Apart from that, I don't see it in any other way. No, I can't see it in any other way. Look, I've got Muslim mates. You know what I mean? I grew up with some Muslim mates like that. I'm not saying Muslim people are bad. I'll say on the. I'll say on the. On the majority, my experiences ain't been great. I've never had no bad experience with English people, never had no bad experience with Jamaican people or Chinese people. You know what I mean? But Muslim people I have plenty of bad experiences with. Um, they, they do have this government and the local councils and, and this country in, in the palm of the hand. Uh, they, they say they say one word. They could they could call a man racist. They could spit their dummy out, and they'll get their way one way or another. Uh, we've seen it when it comes to the grooving scandal. How they've not been arrested because of their mob rule. Back in the day, we were doing demonstrations, and uh, Muslims were getting arrested, and the imams used to turn up with a group of lads to the police station and say, "Let that man go now." You know, because of their mob rule, the police officers are even throwing them out the cells. They take them. You know what I mean? It, it, it's two tier policing. You know what I mean? They do have they do have a lot of benefits in that way. But apart from that, I don't see any other any other. Benefits of being a part of that faith, no, not myself. 
your life must still be in danger, especially with the shit that you're saying. Maybe after this podcast, anyway, Jane, I'm going <laughs> to fucking blame it on you. <laughs> I'll blame it on you if anything happens. Nah, yeah. your podcast gets out to quite a few people. I, you know what? I, I, since I've come out of jail, even before I went to prison, you know what I mean? You always walk down the streets and always be, especially in Nottingham, or it could be in like Birmingham, it could be in London or something. I do get recognised now and then. You know what I mean? And someone will say something. I don't think it's as serious as my life is in, in, in danger. But at the end of the day, all I'm doing is exercising my freedom of speech, my freedom to congregate, and freedom to demonstrate. Um, if my life is ever in danger, the police have 100% responsibility to make sure that no harm ever comes to me because all I'm doing is just fulfilling my God-given rights to me. You know what I mean? That this constitution has given to me and what this this government has given to me and what, this, and what my God has given to us. And so I'm not doing anything wrong at the end of the day. What does the United Kingdom mean to you? UK, England, everything. Everything, yeah, it's beautiful to me. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big royalist. I'm, a, I'm not the biggest King Charles fan, but I was a huge Queen fan, hugest Queen fan. You know what I mean? My whole family are. My, my grandma still talks about it at the time when uh, in Highson Green and Nottingham back in the day when the Queen came past. My grandma, any time you ask her, she goes, "I saw her once." You know, anybody would think that she actually sat down and had tea with her or something. You know what I mean? But yeah. Um, England means everything to me. England is home. I class myself as a British-born sea. Uh, this whole green and pleasant land, you know, it's mine. I'm proud of it. I love it. God bless it. And I'll do anything to protect it, especially that England I know, what I see that's been taken away from us bit by bit. Do you think there'll be change? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I have faith now, especially when I've seen how the movement's moving. The, 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 with the movement, with the sort of traction that is gaining right now, the snowball effect that is happening, the amount of people that are coming out, the amount of people that are starting to really talk about it, the, the, we used to call them, what did we used to call them? Like, not middle class, but you know, there's a sort of section out there that don't want to say anything at all. They may talk behind closed doors at home, shout to the TV, but they're not willing to do anything. I'm seeing a lot of them like come up now. And so I think there can be change 100%. Yeah, we're definitely on the right path for it. If we keep going on this path, we're down that Tommy and his, t that Tommy and his team have created i think we would definitely eventually get somewhere where we in position to force it upon the powers that be to you know start really protecting us like you say i have no issues with anybody any religion any race who yeah. you are yeah. as long as you're doing good 100%. but like i've had tommy on a few times and i've had girls who've been abused by grooming gangs and yeah. listen i've had girls on who've been abused by white men as well yeah yeah, you know yeah. What i mean there's sex 100%. cases fucking everywhere yeah, yeah. but it's um hmm. to train try and create good change for the better yeah and it doesn't matter who yeah but like you say it's all this divide and hate and yeah yeah well, that, well, well, that's, well, well that's the thing uh james when it comes down to you you class yourself as a christian james used to be yeah i'm, I'm more yeah. open-minded to everything now, okay though. got you but you see the christian morals and the Sikh morals are very similar you know what i mean love peace harmony we protect each other you know what i mean that's what we're all about uh, the, hindu, the, the hindu religion is very similar the jewish religion is very similar islamic religion is completely different so you've got this one here and then you've got everybody else that's completely the same and so it's not like everyone's divided. I think everyone over here is, is quite well together. It's just this one that's divided and chooses to segregate and separate itself from everybody else and refuse to integrate. That's the, that, that's the only difference. And that's not me saying it. That's not me pointing the finger or me voicing it. These people have put themselves in that box. They've lived this life. You, you, you've planted your own trees. You, you, you've done this to yourself. You've painted your own picture of yourselves and your people have for 1,600 years. So whatever people have negative to say about you, you can't blame us. This is down to you. This is your fault. If I go and slap a man over there, you, uh, you know, you're, you're going to blame me for assault because I've committed that. But uh, And there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? And that's precisely what I've done. They painted their, they painted themselves with their own brush. And if people are going to speak out about it and be negative because what they are doing is completely alien to what we believe in, then there's no issue with that. What does a good Great Britain look like to you? Oh, I don't know. I think, I mean... If you were Prime Minister yeah. and you could make changes, what changes would you make for the Great changes Britain? changes I'd make, I'd reduce taxes, I'd stop illegal immigration, I'd, 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 I'd allow migration, but only from non-Islamic states. I would have more power to people. You know what I think the most important thing is? Is I think that um, our politicians have forgot that they're slaves and they they and what they act as is slave masters they forgot that they actually work for the people you know you work for us it's our taxes that pay your wages to put you in them buildings to make decisions on our behalf what we say the decisions what we believe that you what we tell you to make you should be making i believe that's the ultimate change to give the power back to the people and so the politicians have finally 
um, maybe they did do back in the day. I think there was a time when, I mean, even Margaret Thatcher always spoke about, um, I believe that every great British man should be able to own his property and have their their government as their slave master. You know what I mean? As their slave, not their slave master. And I believe that's how it should be, that we can raise our families. We don't get taxed and extorted left, right and centre for every other bloody bill that we have coming in and out of our households and that our MPs do actually finally start working for us and not against us and don't make decisions that we don't believe in. I think that's the thing, to give the power back to the people is the ultimate one. What do you think of Israel and Palestine? Um, I'm an Israel supporter. I'm not a Palestinian supporter at all. Um, you attack Palestine. On, uh, uh, sorry, you, uh, pa Palestinians attacked Israel in the in the recent um, on uh, October. What was it? October the seventh, October the eleventh. Um, on the on the recent stink. I mean, it's, it's it's been happening for absolute decades now. Israel reacted, and the whole world's against Israel. I think this whole Palestinian Palest Palestinian marches uh, throw, throwing Hamas flags all over the country. I think it's all just a fashion thing. People, most of the people even joining these demonstrations don't know what they're talking about but my support is completely all the time always will be with Israel and the Jewish community and all you have to do is just to see who's right on this on this topic and who's wrong all you've got to do is just look at the demonstrations you've had in London go and go to a Jewish demonstration see what happens there and go to a Palestinian demonstration and see what happens there and I ask people I ask people go and venture out look at both demonstrations and see what happens you'll see evil and bad in one you'll see good and peace love and harmony in the other so I'm gonna stick with a good peace love and harmony that's just the way I am what about Ukraine and Russia? Um, I, I, I like Putin. Yeah, I kind of like I, I like Putin. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, a lot of people, I've got friends and stuff. I, I've got Ukrainian tenants. <laughs> yeah, you better edit that <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, so look, um, I think what the West what the West and NATO have been doing to Putin since the early 90s um, has been absolute... F I, mean, I mean, first they had that agreement in place that they won't make any movement towards Russia. They completely backed out on that. And, you know, they've been, it's like they've been poking this Rottweiler with a stick for absolute decades, and this Rottweiler's finally reacted a bit. And the minute that Rottweiler's bit onto you, you want to blame the Rottweiler for buying you. That's the way I see it. That, 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 in an analogy, that's how I can put it down. Yeah, I watched yeah. the Putin interview, and he says they had a peace agreement for Ukraine, and it was America who yeah, says yeah, yeah. no. They, they had a peace and that's that, for me, like I say, yeah. all politicians are kind of corrupt and pulling the strings, and who's behind them is a different ball game. But yeah. if you want a leader, then you would kind of sway Putin, who's kind of, oh my God, this yeah. is my ways, he's a strong man, he's not yeah. going to take any shit. But again, I don't know. I'm I mean, not when the, when a fucking when, educational... I, I know, you know, I know, you, know but you know what? But matters of the Baltics aren't my four, foremost bloody subject, you know what I mean? But when, when, when they had the referendum in the Donbass and the people in that part of the Ukraine voted to be part of Russia, you know, they didn't listen to that. They stopped people in the Donbass from speaking Russia. They, they flew in fly to jets and they bombed children. They've got this statue there called... The, they've got this valley there with these statues called the Valley of Angels for all these 167 Russian kids that were killed in, in Donbass in Ukraine. And then you've got all this bullshit that's going on. Then you've got a leader in Russia who's willing to say, you know what, I'm not having my people go through this no more. And he's gone for it. So I can't disagree with anything that Putin has done. Now, I'm not saying he's done everything in right, completely perfect in his whole life. I'm not saying that he hasn't made mistakes here and there. But I'm saying on this situation, I'm with the man. I'm with him. And now I've probably lost about four tenants. <laughs> I'm going to blame this on you, James, again. You look at what George Bush done, Tony Blair. Again, it's not really them. You've got companies like BlackRock and yeah, big yeah, yeah. families who've won four yeah. sides of wars, which is for another discussion. Yeah. But for me, if you can't see the good, be the good. Yeah, 100%. Become a good person. I, I mean, this is the thing. I, I mean, when you talk about these big companies and especially like Big Pharma and all the rest of it, you know, they're in twine with our governments. Right now, I just read a report when it comes to our oil gas prices. I'm still paying £1.50, £1.60 for a litre of diesel right now. There's people out there that are staying due to the evidence and the prices of Brent crude that are so cheap right now. There's no reasons why these prices can't go back to what they were previous to lockdown so like back to a pound a litre we're getting extorted and ripped off left right and center our gas electric is up the fucking roof yet the, the, the ceos of the gas electric companies are making the biggest bonuses they're making the biggest profits in history quarterly yet we're still getting extorted and taxed up to, uh, um, and charged up to death now if we had leaders in place that were actually taking care of uh, taking care of their people and uh, uh, you know we would be in a better position because they'd be turning around to these big organizations and saying you're not going to extort our constituents in this manner that you are doing because it's completely ridiculous so they are both entwined and that that bit that needs to separate there has to be a fucking complete separation from government and big business you know what i mean what makes a good leader to you 
strong, honest, independent. The same reason, any, the same same reason, what a good leader would would be to anyone. But I think the main things would be honesty. It would be honesty. I think humbleness. A lot of them lack a lot of humbleness and selflessness, where they're willing to take care of someone else more than they're willing to take care of their own. I think they're the biggest traits in my eyes, definitely. And that way, they can put themselves in a position to think: How does my constituent feel? How does how does my member of public feel? And really and really give a damn about what they feel and put themselves in them situations and start working for them instead of for themselves. Do you think a lot of people are scared to speak out and speak the truth and what oh. they see, how they see the UK and the world as a whole? A hundred percent. That's yeah. scary because people can lose their jobs. People can yeah. get terrorised because yeah. of certain beliefs and certain yeah. religions. Like I say, I've no issues with anybody. Yeah. As long as you're good, you're good. But if you're a prick, listen, I'm more than fucking. I'll, 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 I'll call it out, no problem. But. Mm. Do you think a lot of people are then scared to join like, the rallies and well, well, with, well, because the of thing. Tommy Robinson's reputation well, well, as well? Well, hundred well, percent. You see, I think this is the thing that keeps happening because we keep going back to this. I mean, especially during the English Defence League, um, a lot of people used to join and they lost their jobs and this, that, and the other. And you know, the landlord would kick them out of the house, or the banks used to shut down the bank accounts and stuff. And yes, that did happen here, there, and everywhere. But people should not feel battered and threatened to be put into a corner where they can't even express their freedom of speech. I mean, that's one of our god-given rights it's in the magna carta it's in the constitution it's a part of what this country is it's a part of what makes us great we're the epicenter of democracy and and so i don't think people should be as concerned as what they should have been concerned during the edl days i don't think it's at that level right now again no more i think people have a lot more freedom to be able to go out there and be a lot more vocal because they've got they've got there's rules and regulations out there to protect them as well and they need to use that but they should never feel so beaten and battered to be not be able to say a single word of what they believe in at all you know what i mean because that's when the totalitarian state really has bloody won and you completely lost all your freedoms that, that you did have in the first place what can people expect in next week's rally i think you're going to have a big number i mean uh, nem told me a little bit about what's actually going on i can't go into too much detail because i don't really know too many details i've been ringing tommy all week he's not fucking answered me once you know what i mean so he gets busy so i just leave it to him i'm just like i'll see him next week um, so there's going to be a march it's starting at the Royal Courts of Justice it starts out at 12pm the march goes can I check yeah, of the course. time because yeah. I don't want to give all the information out That's wrong. wrong information on a bloody James English podcast <laughs> then you'll have about 500,000 people turning up to believe in the middle of nowhere I didn't even save the picture did I Okay, so urbanscoop.news, that is a place to see all the details of the demonstration. There's going to be a march that's starting at Royal Courts of Justice. I think it's around about 12, 1 p.m. Do check Tommy Robinson's Twitter um, to, find, to find out what the final details are. That march is going to Trafalgar Square. They've got a huge screen where Tommy's going to be showing a video. They're going to have bands there. They're going to have people performing. They're going to have people talking. Come along, bring your families. It's going to be a once in a lifetime uh, demonstration. You're not, you, you, you'll never have seen a biggest mass of patriots of this country in one place ever since VE Day. That's a fact. Since VE Day was the last time anybody in London had this sort of pe this many patriots on these streets. So come down, forget about what people say, forget what people are saying about you could lose your job, this and the other. None of that's going to happen. Just make yourselves down, you know, speak up for yourselves join the movement and then from there you can make your decision where you can, whether you come to the next one or not but I think a lot of people are quite reluctant to come as you said because of Tommy Robinson's reputation that reputation doesn't exist it never has done it's always been bullshit and lies don't believe the hype and just get yourselves down here where do you go forward for the future with it all? Well, I mean, I don't really have any sort of involvement in their organisation of uh, the demonstrations and stuff. Tommy has his own little team and do that. Every time there's a demonstration, I mean, the last one, he texts me the night before, he goes, fucking hell, I've got this on me. I said, look, don't worry about nothing. I mean, I've been there before. I've done it all before. I'm right next to you. If you need me for anything, I've got you. So I just keep myself close to him. If he needs me, I'm there. In the future, I just keep carrying on supporting the movement. I'll keep promoting them, promoting their movement as much as I can. And hopefully I can get a little bit. I mean, I've only just started coming out to do the social media media thing again since the EDL days recently so I'm kind of like new to the game as well so hopefully I can gain a little bit of traction so I can promote their movement and promote everything that they're standing for myself so that can be my own little bit but I'm not going to be silent anymore myself you know what I mean I've seen what's happening in this country and I want to start speaking out again so that's precisely what I'm going to start doing and we'll start 
on the James English podcast. <laughs> I don't start. <laughs> what there. a great start, eh? <laughs> How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good, man. You know what I mean? It's really nice to see you. Thank you so much. I mean, James, I, I messaged you before. I mean, a lot of th when I want something in life, I'm usually having to bang my head against the wall or kicking it down to get it myself. But thank you, thank you for being so welcoming and inviting me and giving me this chance to get myself down there and get myself down there to do a podcast for yourself and, you know, get ourselves out there a little bit yeah, more. So thank what, you very much for that. Anytime, yeah. like I say, listen, I'm happy to sit with someone who's Sikh, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, yeah. whoever. Yeah. And then um, Palestine, Israel, Ukraine, Russia. Yeah. Our job is just to ask the questions. Yeah, and it's I've down to the you. person to and answer. And you do that. a great job of it as well, Thank my you. mate. You know and, what I mean? Uh, you do an excellent job. Yeah, listen, it'll be fun in games to see where the UK goes. I don't have all the answers for that. I try and concentrate on me, my family. I, yeah, I'm the same, um, my brother. But I'll tell you what we could do, mate. Let's see where we go in the next year or two. Maybe we could sit down again and have yeah, another let's, chat. Let's, let's go for it, man. Job done. Uh, <laughs> would you like to finish I'll up on anything Pardon? else? No, that's everything. Thank you once again for coming. And like I said, urbanscoop.news, all of Tommy's books are available. They're all available now. Urbanscoop.news is the website. You can try and type in a <laughs> discount code of Gurumit Singh. I don't think it'll work, but any support. And like I said, 27th of July, get yourselves yeah. down there. Trafalgar Square It's going to be one hell of an event. <laughs> well done, mate. Yankee <laughs> just says thanks for coming. So it must be your podcast. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. Is that what I said? I'm so sorry. Welcome, I'm so for sorry. <laughs> Fucking own it already. <laughs> anything yeah. goes shows with Gurumit Singh. Yeah, let's start. <laughs> uh, hope it goes well next week hope it's yeah. peaceful hope people can get yeah. whatever they're searching for wishing nothing but the best God bless yeah. and take thank care thank you so much James cheers pal nice one